Today I'm going to take a look at the latest version of the Traska Summiteer. It's a watch that I've reviewed in the past. I've reviewed the first version, I believe, uh, and now we're a couple iterations in. They've now introduced this 36 millimeter size, and let's see how it looks. So we have a diameter of 36.5, lug to lug of 43.7, height of 10.6, and a lug width of 20 millimeters. Some other general specifications for this watch, we're going to have the Miyota 9039 beating away in here. It is a closed case back, so we can't see through to that. The watch has 100 meters of water resistance with a screw down crown, which is nice to see. Uh, we use BGW9 for the loom and hands here. We do also have a double domed end box sapphire crystal here, which actually has AR coating on the underside, which is nice. It's not on both sides, not going to get scratched or anything. And what's cool about Traska, and they do this on other watches, they have a proprietary hardening treatment, which makes it, I believe, about six times more scratches than the typical just untreated stainless steel. So it's nice to see there's gonna be a little bit more longevity to just the wearing experience of the watch, and it's not bad, especially for the price point. Last but not least, the watch retails directly from Traska for $600. So starting off with the dial here, and this is now, I guess you can kind of say the classic Summiteer dial. They have used this. This is now, I believe, the third or fourth generation of this dial, or, or of this model in particular. And this is one of the first times, uh, I believe, that they used the 36 millimeter size. They're now kind of going to the original Explorer size, which is nice to see. You, of course, have the classic Explorer style layout here. We have the 369 written in numerals. We have the triangle 12 at top, and then rectangular markers for all the other indices. We have a nice seconds track on the outboard. I wouldn't quite call it a full railroads track because it's not bound on either side. It's just an initial circular track sweeping all around and then kind of stick markers uh, on the outside edge. It kind of looks like a railroad track at some angles because of that box and domed crystal. There's distortion at the edges. So sometimes it can look uh, almost completed or it looks like the lines go all the way to the very end of the dial, which is just kind of a cool effect. And something that I didn't really uh, expect and something I don't think that was really there as prevalently in previous generations or it didn't stick out to me as much as it does now. We have a sword style handset here which I really like. It differentiates itself from other you know Rolex copy wannabe homages in a sense. It gives it its own type of feel, its own type of design language and it's a homage without being too much of a blatant copy. We of course have pretty minimal text here, Traska logo here at the 12, Traska just written underneath that, and automatic at the six o'clock, nothing else on the dial. Very clean, very simple, and honestly, it's an amazing dial. They have this beautiful depth here with this slight cave down, this slight recess for the middle section, which basically holds the hour hand, and it's kind of the track of the hour hand. Uh, gives a lot of depth to the dial. The markers themselves are three-dimensional raise off the dial itself, giving even more depth. You have this kind of charcoal black tone, which at some angles is almost a pure black, some angles of more charcoal matte color. It is just a watch with a surprising amount of depth, surprising amount of detail, and beautiful symmetry. They didn't add a date and ruin the symmetry. Uh, they didn't uh, kind of ruin that 369 Explorer style by adding a date at three or adding a date at six and foregoing the numeral. It just is a clean, classic, simple looking watch and really has the elements executed simply and well. One thing I will note is in some angles and some lighting situations, you can tell the whiteness of the loom differentiates itself from the whiteness of the actual applied numerals. I believe these are made out of like a solid block of BGW9 in a sense. So I don't know if this block formation of loom is different from the applied version on the handset. Uh, a little bit more powdery, a little bit different of a white tone to it. So keep that in mind. In direct sunlight, it's not that big of a deal, but at some angles, if you're a stickler like me, you can notice that difference. So taking a look in natural light, we can see in the more shaded lighting, it goes a very deep black and kind of you don't see that middle ridge either. It becomes just a soft, nice, natural black dial that almost looks flat. Uh, but once you start moving around, you can kind of see it pop out a little bit. And I like that dual nature uh, about the watch itself. Once you get into direct sunlight though, you very clearly see the detail more, that uh, ridge center pops out a lot more. At kind of off angles, it still goes deep black, but the charcoal tones come out a lot more to play. Uh, and it just becomes a little bit grayer overall. You can see here the brushing is super evenly done, like it is just a really well executed watch. Uh, even in direct sunlight, even in shade, it has a consistency and a beauty uh, about the finishing and about the depth to the dial and the kind of color changingness that it surprisingly has in what otherwise seems like a plain black dial. So zooming in on the dial here, we see these small little details that come to life a little bit more, the three-dimensionality of the text, 
uh, on the dial. Of course, there's not much text, but thankfully it matches pretty well with the thickness and application of the seconds track as well. Uh, I would say I would like to see it maybe just a slight bit thicker, but again, very small nitpick. Uh, and then you can again see how three-dimensional those loom plots are. There aren't any metal surrounds. It's a full block of solid loom, which unfortunately doesn't glow that crazily. Uh, I mean, expect from being a solid block for it to glow a little bit more, but as it stands, it's okay. It's not great. And I think at this kind of magnification, you can tell a little bit that the hand loom looks a little bit more pure white than the block loom does. So again, keep that in mind. What's nice is the loom on the hands isn't patchy. There isn't any missing splotches. It's all pretty evenly applied. So it's nice to see that there. It is unfortunate with being the only metal element on the watch, the hands are finished to kind of a rougher standard than I would expect. They aren't QC'd that well. They're a little bit fuzzy on the edges. There's marks all throughout or really just like dust specks or maybe even loom specks uh, all throughout the hands. I would like to see them a little bit better done. Like there's a really major scratch there on the seconds hand. So this is one of the poorer QCs I've seen from a watch at this price point. And uh, with how good the rest of the watch comes together, I would expect this part to be done a little bit better, but I've never noticed any of these imperfections from wrist. So it is one of those odd trade-offs. Again, you won't notice these imperfections until you look at your watch with a loop and how scrutinous should you really be for a $600 watch. Digressing slightly, at least the hands themselves do have a beautiful shape to them, bifaceted, very gently kind of curved down on both sides. Uh, so nice. I do wish it was almost maybe a little bit thicker of a handset, just give it a little bit more metal, a little bit more shine. But as it stands, I don't mind it either. It's, it's well done, and again, I just do like the shape of everything. Even at this close of a magnification, it's nice to see how much color depth the dial actually has. I usually get a little bit... Uh, kind of disheartened when you get like a somber style that's just always way too aggressive and too much or a, a super black dial that's like super reflective and kind of inky but you can't really see what's going on. This strikes a nice balance because it's matte, it kind of absorbs reflections but you get kind of a dark black inkiness depending on the light. So it's a nice, uh, nice execution of a black dial and you get this almost pimpled painted texture to the dial itself. And you can see there at the six o'clock a little, little spot similar to what we see on the seconds hand, maybe even a little bit more on that dial surface there between the six and the seven o'clock marker. So this isn't a perfect dial in terms of QC, but it is pretty well done. And again, at wrist view, none of these problems come to light. So I would say it's fair for the price, but a little bit more uh, trouble than I was expecting, I guess you could say. So moving on to the case of this watch, and I think this is a lovely part about it. It's nice to see that Trask is sized down to this 36 millimeter size, a little bit more classical, a little bit more traditional, a nice, almost really perfect 1016 alternative. And I guess you can say also just the new 36 millimeter Explorer as well. This kind of is a, what I wish Rolex would make as a modern uh, Explorer. It's kind of, not too modernized, not too flashy, not too luxurious feeling. It's still tool watch enough, but it has classic refinement. You of course have a case that's very reminiscent of an oyster case, nothing groundbreaking. You have vertical brushing here on the top of the lugs, a sunburst brushing here on the top of the bezel, a nice polished chamfer and kind of angle as well, the edge of the bezel here and a nice high polished side, so no brushing there. Nice little Trask logo in the crown there. The vertical brushing of the case leads perfectly into the bracelet, and it is just nicely done. It catches the light nicely. Uh, what I do really like is some of the earlier Trask models had the same kind of hardening coating, but it was just done a little bit differently and left kind of a more gunmetal gray appearance to the metal, whereas this is much more pure stainless steel looking, uh, which I like. It, just is brighter, it's a little bit more vibrant, it's a little bit more lively, uh, and I think it looks more premium that way. Of course, you have the classic kind of unnecessary Trask of Perlage in the clasp. Don't hate it, don't love it, it's there. Uh, nice little sign Trask logo on the clasp, and then some holes of micro adjust, which is always welcome. Uh, it's always nice to see. Thankfully, they're not going with like a butterfly deployment or anything crazy like that, or no micro adjust at all. Uh, twin trigger release, of course. The clasp itself is a pretty good mechanism. It feels very sturdy. I would say the pushers are maybe a little bit on the big side. They kind of stick out very uh, long from the case, I can say, very wide from the case. So 
it's a little bit odd. I wish they could make that maybe just a little bit more streamlined, but again, very small nitpick there. I do like that they went with this classical dramatic taper from a 20 to a 16 millimeter. It just feels good. It fits the size of the watch. I think if you're going for a 36 with a 20 millimeter lug, if you don't do taper, it just feels a little bit odd proportionally, and this just feels right. One thing I will say that kind of stands out to me is the bezel draws my eye in a weird way, I guess you could say. The bezel is very flat. It's almost perfectly flat. There is no curve. There is no uh, concavity to it. There is no slope to it. Uh, so it's one of those weird things where if you look at a Rolex Explorer, it actually does have a angle to it. It has a slope to it that rises up to the crystal. And to me, that's better executed, at least in my opinion, because it kind of leads the eye visually down from the bezel into the rest of the watch, where this is just flat on top of flat and it makes the watch almost feel too flat in my opinion. So that's just something that I'm not in love with. It grows on me as I wear it more, but uh, I don't know if it would be better if that design decision was made. That's just something I've noticed where it's different from a traditional oyster case. So take that for what you will. What I do love is that polished accent along the bezel. It does catch the light, it does catch your eye, and it's a really welcome addition. Just like the case sides having the high polish, the bracelet does the exact same thing. We also can see we have drill lug holes, which is a really nice aspect here. And beautifully enough, super thin case. You don't have a very thick case back. The crystal's taking up, uh, and bezel really, is taking up a lot of the height on top. So you have a very thin and slightly curvaceous mid case, which ends up making this watch wear extremely well on wrist. It's super comfortable and it's a great size. Looking at the case back, just solid kind of uh, sunray finish brushing. Uh, of course, text on the outside, nothing crazy. More text than Rolex case pack, so hey, you know, I'll take it. And before we move on, the crown itself has a pretty nice action to it. It unwinds pretty smoothly. Uh, the actual winding of the movement it's a little grainy it's and it's going to blow your mind or feel super premium. It feels like all other Miyota 9 series movements out there. Actually setting the time, however, pretty buttery smooth. So that is nice. It feels, I guess, more premium than you would expect for that type of movement. Screwing in the crown, similarly very smooth. Uh, and I think the crown is well proportioned as well. So uh, no complaints there. And of course, we use uh, full screw links in the bracelet too, which is a nice touch. It's also nice that they didn't go overboard with thickness of the bracelet. They didn't make it overly sporty. It has a nice feltness to it. It's thin enough to where it feels comfortable and it feels at harmony with like the thickness of the watch. Uh, but it's not too thin where it feels dainty or not sporty enough. Moving on to how this watch wears, I was wearing my uh, Omega Schumacher here. And here we have the Traska sitting on my six and a half inch wrist. And I think it fits just perfectly. Uh, plenty of room on both sides of my wrist. Uh, it's not nearing too big by any means. Even if I move it up a little bit and I have closer to a six inch wrist here, still plenty of real estate. You can probably wear it on a five inch wrist, maybe even four and a half if you're pushing it. But this will fit a lot of wrist sizes. It's pretty compact lug to lug. Again, pretty thin so it wears really close to the wrist. It is just a very pleasurable wearing uh, watch overall. I will also state kind of putting on the watch, taking it on and off, it's like buttery smooth on the inside, which is a really nice touch. The kind of machining that's done, it doesn't have any super harsh edges uh, or rough edges on the links. The case back itself is also like weirdly buttery smooth. So it is just one of those ones where like, as you're sliding it on the wrist, you're like, oh, this kind of just feels nice. It feels premium. I don't know what Traska is doing in particular that's making that smooth and svelte feel on wrist, but keep doing it because it's amazing. I also like that they went for a female end link here. It just helps the watch not wear any bigger than it has to be. The lug to lug is the true lug to lug. It doesn't wear any larger or flatter than that. You can see there from this side view, it really sits just like into the wrist. It, it really almost disappears, especially since you have these nice rounded soft edges. Uh, the bottom of the case back isn't that sharp either. It is just one of those watches that that super, is super comfortable, it is pleasurable. Again, it feels like soft is almost the way to say it. Uh, so yeah, I don't think anyone's gonna be mad about the wearing experience and because you have the, the links and that are fairly small and the micro just in the clasp, you can probably get a pretty perfect fit. So moving on to some other straps, this is this nice uh, Batero leather strap from King Leathercraft, natural Batero, no treatment to it. Uh, although they don't make straps at the moment anymore, you can kind of just look for natural Patera leather. Delugs make some. I'm sure your favorite strap maker makes some. Uh, so you'll get a similar kind of look once the leather ages in a little bit. This particular strap is 20 millimeters to 18. So you're getting a little bit less of a taper, more of a full look to the strap. 
in my opinion, it's a little aggressive. It's a little bit thick for you know the style of watch. If you're trying to make the 36 millimeter feel bigger, then by all means go for it. Uh, but it's not my favorite, and I'll kind of put it on a more tapering strap to kind of show you how that looks. By comparison, this is a beautiful cork leather strap from Theo and Harris, or technically Theo and Harris with collaboration with John Rousseau. Uh, and this is 20 millimeters to 16. To me, the stronger taper looks just a little bit better on a watch like this especially just because it's a smaller watch head, it kind of helps balance it out and not feel as heavy or as much of like a bunt style strap. So yeah, I dig the combo and this cork is just a really cool, nice uh, kind of textural touch to a watch that doesn't have anything crazy going on with the dial. You add a little bit of fun with the strap itself. So yeah, cool combo. Next, if you want to add a little bit of life, a little bit of fun to it, there's this nice textured FKM rubber strap from Weiss Watches. Uh, WISE, those strap will be linked down below. Pretty cool, adds a little bit of a pop of color. Thankfully with the black strap, it's super monochromatic, so you can kind of put any color on it as long as you're able to pull off the color yourself. And there we go, a little bit of a sportier look. Not too bad in my opinion. Again, because you have that very subtly textured or I guess, you know, dimensional dial, it is relatively simple, so you can add cool, fun textures or colors with the strap and kind of mix it up and have fun there. Next, for those who don't want to be too adventurous, we have this nice uh, gray silicone NATO strap. Super thin, so it doesn't really add any height to the watch and just wears well on wrist. It adds a little bit of color, but nothing too dramatic. Uh, wears really well, plants it even better if you don't really like how the bracelet feels or just want to make it a little bit sportier. Uh, and yeah, really cool combo, really comfortable, and really no complaints. And last but never least, the white Archer silicone strap. I do think it's kind of odd that I typically don't like the non-tapering straps on this watch, but I love this one, which is a 20 to 20 non-tapering strap. I don't know if it's just so bright that it just feels better. I don't, I, I don't quite know. All I know is I like it and I think it looks good. Pairs well with the loom, pairs well with the monochromatic theme, uh, and it's super comfortable. Really plants the watch amazingly. Again, pairs well with every tone on the dial. Fits the monochromatic theme, but just makes the watch a little bit brighter, a little bit less serious, uh, and yeah, looks amazing. So taking a look at the loom here, and it's okay. It looks a lot better on camera than it does in person. It's a little bit duller. For example, if I bring in this Christopher Ward Sealander, typically uh, this has X1 loom, uh, or X1 C1 loom which is typically a little bit less bright than BGW9, but again, they have almost exactly the same color tone and the Trasca dies faster, just by a small margin, but it does die faster. So it's one of those things where, although it's BGW9 on the Trasca, it's not fantastic. Relooming and comparing to the Timex, we have similar color tones. Of course, the Timex is more legible, it's brighter. That's why every uh, watch should have Indiglow, right? Uh, but digressing, again, the Trasca looks decent. It's very legible in the dark, so, if you're only using it for like short spurts in the dark or kind of just at the very beginning of it being loomed, it's serviceable, but it's not something that's gonna last you until morning or anything like that. Something I didn't notice as much uh, until we actually got it loomed up is you have these little pips here at the three, six, nine, and 12. So that's kind of just a cool little feature, a little touch of the uh, loom signature that doesn't really pop out until you actually get it loomed. So pros and cons of this watch, and one of the biggest pros for me is just the design itself. Although it is taking heavy inspiration from the Rolex Explorer, it is doing it in its own way. It's not using Mercedes hands, it's not doing a one-to-one -one copy, it's adding little design elements that make it both unique and I think arguably more interesting than a base model Explorer. It has that dial dip in the center, which I just think looks beautiful and adds a nice depth to the overall watch experience. And then you have this handset, which is more of a sword style handset, which I think not only pair with the watch beautifully and look very legible, but again, it's, it's going in its own direction away from the Mercedes hand. All these little tweaks make the watch both interesting and more than just a copy. Another big pro for me is gonna be both the case build, the case construction, as well as the coating used on the watch and the bracelet itself. Uh, the bracelet's machined well, it's very smooth, it feels very comfortable on wrist. Uh, it has a great shape to it, it has great proportions. So there's a lot to love about the quality that you're getting here with the case construction. And it's just a cherry on top with the fact that you're not gonna get those common wear and tear scratches on the watch. I've seen people who have had these for months, if not uh, years, and their coating holds up almost perfectly. There's almost no scratches on it at all. So it's nice to see that this watch kind of has that built in longevity to it, that built in uh, like a new watch experience because it's gonna kind of always look new, even though it's kind of a rough and tumble, can go anywhere, do anything kind of watch, you're not gonna scratch it doing those things with this watch. 
And last but not least, I think a huge pro for this watch is the price. I think it's very in line with the quality. If not, you're getting way more than you would expect in, in most aspects. Uh, again, the case construction is amazing. It fits well, it feels good on wrist. And I think that's a problem that a lot of companies struggle with at this sub thousand dollar price point. Is the case as good as the rest of the components or even are the rest of the components up to snuff? Right? I think this watch does it well in most areas. The movement's thin enough, the case construction feels good. It just is a really nice package overall, and there's not many places I can fault it. Even if this watch was closer to $1,000, I still think it'd be great value if some tiny minor quality of life adjustments were improved, like you know, just some of the QC issues or uh, maybe the uh, dial having some small tweaks to it. But again, it's a lot of watch for the money. So moving on to cons, and one of the Bigger cons I feel, and one that I didn't expect, is that the loom isn't great. Uh, the loom strength really just isn't there. It dies off fairly quickly, and it seems like it should have good loom because it's kind of a solid block of loom. Uh, it seems like that would be a good way to do it, but I guess maybe it's just not that strong in this type of formulation or this type of application. Uh, I don't know the answer or the reason, but do something differently. I do honestly just think personally that the dial would even be better off doing a very thick, multiple layer application of standard loom and then bordering the loom numeral in some kind of white or possibly black ink or black kind of whatever application uh, that would help some contrast give it some you know depth perception and just look awesome i think that would kind of make the watch look a little bit classier than this almost more utilitarian block loom style another con for me is just the qc issues the hands were a little bit rough uh, it's one of the rougher handsets I've personally seen, you know, uh, almost hundreds of watches I've taken a look at. Uh, so it's one of those weird things where the rest of the watch, especially the metal elements of the case and bracelet are done so well. It's not something I really expected to see when I was zoomed in, but it's there. So I do think that's something they can improve upon a little bit. Is it glaring and obvious from wrist view? No. Is it maybe within their QC specs? Maybe. Uh, but if they do really want to strive to make like the best product they can, they could probably tighten that uh, tolerance a little bit. And lastly is a really small point of just uh, design contention in my opinion. I don't love uh, the 12 o'clock marker. I do know for a fact that in previous generations the marker was a little bit bigger and to me it looked more proportional that way. I do think some of the indices and markers were also just smaller or bigger. There was, there was different proportions previously. So with this newest generation, I do think they went a little small on the 12 o'clock. It looks a little bit too dainty. Uh, the shape I don't think is uh, just right for the rest of the watch, even though it may look in line with the thickness of everything else, or it may be the similar size as the three, six, and nine. The 12 is such a potent part of the design and it's a different shape from then everything else that I think it needs to be a little bit bigger, a little bit more impactful. Uh, and I think it will look better on the watch. So final thoughts on this watch, and I honestly think it's pretty fantastic for what you're getting. Is it the most perfect watch on planet Earth? No, but I think it's gonna be 90% of the way there for most people. And especially if you're looking for like a good quality and much more affordable Rolex Explorer alternative, or just a kind of perfect everyday field watch, this is that. Uh, you're getting great water resistance, you're getting a perfect size, you could get options between 36 and 38 millimeter, you got a lot of color variation. Uh, sure, the loom could use improvement, but the watch is comfortable, the watch is thin, the watch wears well, uh, and I do think the dial is just beautifully executed. It's legible, it's clean, and it's good looking, arguably, at least to me. Are there small things that maybe I would change on the watch? Absolutely, but I don't think there are many watches where I wouldn't change things to them. What I think Trask is doing specifically so well, and I mean, at the very least with this model range, is there isn't really a direct competitor uh, and even if there is, they're usually doing it much more homage and they're doing it a little bit more cheaply. This is taking a quality first kind of execution and it wears well. It presents as a really nice watch. It just happens to also be inspired by an Explorer. If you took the Explorer kind of DNA out of it, it would still be a really good watch. It just happens to take inspiration from something that's already awesome. I like that they did it in their own way. I like that they executed this well. And again, I don't think you'll be disappointed if this is something that's on your radar, if there's something that's interesting to you. It gets my stamp of approval. I think it's a really great watch. I'm very excited to see what Traska comes out with next. I only uh, expect really good things for the most part. Uh, I haven't really been disappointed so far. So uh, 
yeah, if you get one, let me know. Let me know how you enjoy it. If you already have one, let me know. And those are my thoughts. So yeah, thank you as always for watching. Hope you got something out of the video. Uh, hope to see you in another one and I'll catch you later.